Well, thank you for coming to my talk. I'm really happy to be here today uh, to talk about a personal problem of mine, and also a problem that faces many other open source developers. The, uh, the problem specifically with maintaining open source. But first, a little history. Homebrew, I, uh, I made that. Who here, uh, who here has used Homebrew? <laughs> It was uh, 2009, and I was working at a small company in London. Um, we, my team worked on the apps. We had six apps, one for Windows, one for Linux, one for Mac, iPhone, Android, and even the BlackBerry app. And I'm pleased to say that there is no more BlackBerry apps. It was a, a terrible, terrible SDK. We hated working for it. But the unifying platform that we used was the Mac. It made it possible to emulate Linux and Windows, and all the SDKs just worked. But the open source tooling on Mac at the time was not up to my standards. And I used to complain about this a lot. I'd go to the pub after work with my friends, and I'd moan and moan about the state of tooling for open source on Mac, until one day one of my friends got fed up with me and told me to shut the F up and go home and do something about it. So I did. I went home, and I made the first commit to homebrew. After a few weeks of that, I realized that I was working on something that maybe had legs. It was interesting. And I thought maybe the rest of the world would like to see it. So I open sourced it. This is a video that shows commits over time on the homebrew code base. And as you can see, initially, it was just me working on it. Even though I'd open sourced it, nobody knew about it. But I talked about it, and eventually, a few other people started turning up. And then suddenly, one day, someone from Ruby on Rails tweeted about Homebrew. They said that they wanted uh, to install Homebrew on their new Mac when they got it in a couple of months. And Hacker News got hold of it seven times in one week, I was told. And like, it just exploded. Uh, suddenly, I was working on a project that thousands of other people were working on. And I discovered that this was really fun. I'd been working in open source on and off for years, but nothing I'd done had been like this big. And after a while, I discovered I lost interest in my day job. All I wanted to do was work on homebrew. So I quit. I had a bit of money saved up, and I decided that I would work full time on homebrew. Eventually, even though that was extremely satisfying, I ran out of money, and I had to get another job. And it turned out this was going to be a cycle for my career, where I would have a job to save up some money. Some, some of these jobs I really enjoyed. Like I didn't like working on things I didn't like working on. But uh, I wanted to work on open source. That was my passion. But the only way I could do that was this cycle. And then, you know, there's something that's not right about that. Here I created something enormously valuable. All these companies were using it. I knew this because I was getting at google.com and at apple.com email addresses on these pull requests. And yet, I was working evenings and weekends or quitting jobs to work on it full time. And in fact, nowadays, you know, Homebrew was 15 years ago. But now, open source has become, and even then, like it built the internet. It's the foundation of all software. It's infrastructure that powers the world that we know. 97% of commercial code contains open source nowadays, and that probably doesn't surprise any of you. And in fact, you probably feel the same as me, like where is this 3% and how can I stay away from it? <laughs> A recent study by some university, it's in the link, uh, uh, decided that the value of the open source code that exists out there is $8.8 .8 $8 trillion, like a phenomenal amount. And yet, so little of that value that it represents trickles down to the open source creators who maintain it. So, like, almost nothing, frankly. And there's all these companies that have made billions and billions of dollars. Like, I don't like to name names, but, you know, Airbnb, they make $1 for every $1,500 that is spent worldwide. And last year, they donated $150,000 to open source. Like, uh, yeah, that's a lot of money, but it's also not, right? That's not even really a software developer's salary. So we call this the Nebraska problem after this famous XKCD comic. 
It was actually released the same year as Homebrew. It, the problem is that old. It's that well known. It's been known for that long. And it represents all open source as these bricks that have been stacked on top of each other. And that's how open source works, right? Like you release something that is valuable, and then other people build on top of that. You've, you've created something new for them to invent new ideas. And it spreads, and it gets taller and taller. But some of those blocks are fragile. They're teetering at the bottom there. And this comic says, a project some random person in Nebraska has been thanklessly maintaining since 2003. And there's Nebraska projects all over the place. This is a quote from the maintainer of CoreJS. CoreJS is downloaded a billion times a week. It's ludicrous. This thing is in every single Node app. It's in almost every single JavaScript app that exists. And yet, I bet hardly any of you have heard of it. He says, I'm effing tired. We all know which F that is. Free open source software is fundamentally broken. Companies that save and earn many millions of dollars on CoreJS usage just ignore funding requests. I've got a lot of good job offers, but if I accept a full-time offer, CoreJS will become just useless and die. FFmpeg, a fantastic project. It actually powers all online streaming services, Netflix, Disney+, Plus, HBO, I mean, I mean Max, and all, all the new ones, all the old ones. Every now and again, they send out this tweet. They're barely funded. And it's not just about the injustice of the situation, like it is unjust, but it's not just about that. When you have all these developers who haven't got the time to spend on their code base, then security is a secondary consideration. A few years ago, about the same time I was trying to raise money for tea, uh, which was very fortunate timing. I'm kind of glad of it in some respects, but not glad because you know this was a, a terrible root exploit for the entire internet. There's this project called Log4j, very much a Nebraska project, very deep in the stack. And this massive root exploit was found in it that took all these servers all over the world and made them easy to exploit just by typing something in. And for like a week or so, it was devastating. The developers got a lot of flack, a lot of abuse, in fact, on Twitter. The, the people were angry that the software they've never paid anything for wasn't working like it said it would. And they said on Twitter, look, we understand you're angry. We're embarrassed. Like, open source developers are embarrassed when these sort of bugs happen. These things are our babies. We don't want them to have these kinds of issues. But, you know, we only have so much time. So they said, we'll fix the bug, but maybe some of these companies that make tons of money on the stack that contains our code could send us some funding after this is all done. And they fixed the bug, but they're still pretty much unfunded. Well, there's lots of ways that people have tried to fix this problem. But they all seem to have the same kind of pattern, where they treat open source like it's a charity. The only thing it can deserve is some public good, heart of gold funding, the only thing that most developers can expect is five bucks for a coffee. And uh, it's not working. I thought a few years ago, when I was once again in between jobs, trying to work on open source full time, I'd go and look to see if there was anything new. And there was nothing new. And I thought, OK, maybe someone new needs to take an approach at this problem. I thought, the things that we tried are not working. And it's time to try something new. So I went wild. I looked at all the technologies I hadn't really looked at before, trying to find something that maybe would fit. Because open source doesn't really fit into a capitalist model. The economics don't work. Open source is weird. But how does it work, exactly? People are giving away all this stuff for free, and they're doing it. And it, it's just miraculously all existing and empowering the entire internet. It doesn't fit into our system of economics. And I discovered that cryptocurrencies mean that you can build new systems of economics. And I had this light bulb moment where I understood that I could build something that might fix the problem. So I founded T. T's mission is to correct this problem, to fix the Nebraska problem, to take the value that open source represents and make it tangible, to expose it, and then to distribute it to the open source maintainers that power the internet and keep all this infrastructure running. And we built it. 
This was three years ago. We've actually been running our test net since February. And it's composed of four main pieces, like the most important of which is obviously incentivizing the maintainers of open source. Every 24 hours, we give open source projects T-token, represented by how impactful their projects are. And we calculate that impact using Chai, the bottom one there. Chai is our on-chain oracle. It takes all 10.5 million open source packages that there are and uses package manager data. This was one of my key insights to calculate the relative impacts of all the different open source projects. The higher your project's impact, the higher your T-token rewards. And along the way, I also discovered that there's neat features of the Web3 sector that we can apply while using blockchain technologies. On-chain governance is really neat. People get votes based on how related to the project their contributions are. Uh, most open source projects already have some kind of government structure, but this allows them to formalize it, put it on chain, make it transparent, and use token as a voting agent. We've also developed the ability for people to do software bills and materials using our Chai on-chain database. We think what we deliver with Chai gives an extra level of granularity about the impact and the threat of different parts of the open source stack that companies may be using. During our test net, we actually have got 1.7 million people that have started using it since February. This is uh, you know, great numbers, uh, even for a Web2 project. But for a Web3 project, this is kind of unheard of. And it turns out only a third of these users are developers. Two thirds of these users are people that just understand the message that open source is something that has tremendous value. It's just nobody has figured out how to expose that value to people so that they can participate in that economics before. Also, 17,000 open source projects. Really pleased about that. I've spoken to three or 400 open source developers over the last three years. And without much, uh, without many of them saying no, they all want to work on open source full time. This, that's their passion. Like, people don't make open source projects because they're not you know, interested in doing it. They wanted to do that, but they find that they have to do something in order to pay the rent or support their families. They're extremely excited about what we're building. Testnet's been running since February, and we're hoping to launch the full project this year or early next year. The key piece of what we built is Chai. This is our on-chain database that calculates the impact of all open source projects. It works by taking that package manager data the dependency information. When you create a project, you're staking your reputation on the dependencies you pick. It's like page rank, but for the open source network. This makes a, a system for calculating impact that's very difficult to game. If we use downloads or other regular metrics that people might expect us to use in order to determine the impact of projects, then people would run bots and download as many of their packages as they could in order to increase their rewards. Like, as soon as you introduce money into things, people will find a way to exploit it. So our system is very carefully designed to make sure that that isn't possible. And we're open sourcing Chai today. It's hopefully live right this second. And uh, we hope that you will go there and give, give us all your typo fixes. I always enjoy those ones. And uh, like more importantly, we want people to see that what we're doing is transparent, that we're making things that are open source for the open source community to be governed and controlled by the open source community. We also need a little help. We've done seven package managers, and we need all the rest. And we would like to see what you think in general. Like there are gaps in our impact calculations, and we want people to go in there and give us ideas. We've come up with as many as we can, but now we'd like to turn it over to you. So that's T. We're fixing the Nebraska problem without changing the nature of open source. This was extremely important to me going into this, that this problem needed to be solved. 
But if I changed how open source works, I would never forgive myself. I love open source, it's beautiful, it's a miracle. And we can't change how that works. But T was very carefully des designed from the start to just incentivize the problems, the gaps, and not change the incentive structure anywhere else. So I hope you will go to t.xyz, check out the testnet, and uh, the full project launching very soon. Thank you.